Now, I learned something uh, last night that I have to try really quick, so I have to go, T-O-L? Yeah. All right, so we got to have fun this morning. i got to thank you for coming out early in the morning to listen to a leadership speaker. So right now, look at somebody next to you and just give them a high five and say, thank you. Thank you. Here we go. <laughs> now, I, now, now, see, I said to go ahead and high five one person. Everybody's like, okay, if you like high fiving so much, find somebody else right now. Just high five and say, you're awesome. Hey, there we go. Yeah. Now, I don't know how it was in your house, but they said it's not polite to point. But we have to make sure we connect with people in the room right now. So look around the room. If somebody's staring back at you right now, point at them and say, you're special. You're special. You're special. <laughs> Here we go. But I want to prove to you right now how awesome and how special you are. And here's how awesome and special you are. I want you to just go ahead and hold your finger up just like this in the air. And I'd like you to go ahead and just write out your name. Cursive, print, whatever you want to go and do. I know some of you are like, man, he is still writing. <laughs> okay, the reason I had you write your name out, everybody, because your name is what makes you awesome, makes you special. It's what makes you memorable. It's what people will know you for. We're here at a leadership conference, and as leaders, you're always going to be remembered by not only your actions, but your name. So every action you take comes down to your name. So you have to feel awesome. You have to feel, feel special. And for me, the first leaders I had in my life were my parents, and I wasn't feeling so awesome and special growing up. Let me explain a little bit about me. That's me. Oh, yeah. Now, I tell people I didn't feel so awesome and special growing up because it wasn't about the hairstyle my mom gave me, okay? It wasn't about the clothes that she put me in. It was about the name. Look at that name. Frank Cornelius Kitchen. My, thank you for laughing. Thank you. Over here. She is turning red. My name has 21 letters in it, people. How many letters are there in the alphabet? Six. Right. Hopefully just making sure. I am five short. It took me until about middle school to learn how to spell my name. I was not feeling awesome and special, but when I figured it out, I was high-fiving myself and pointing to myself going, you're awesome, you're special. Because why would a parent give their kid a name that they cannot spell? I told people this was visual proof that my parents are evil. <laughs> but I got through it. And when I got to high school and I'm telling people I could spell my name, like, so what's the big deal? Like, that's not important anymore. I was like, why do you mean it's not important? They go, well, you're in high school. You're about to go to college. It's all about your student ID number. Because no one asks us about our name anymore, right? We've got to memorize our student ID number. Or when you come to conferences like this, or you sign off on paperwork, scholarship applications, grants, they ask you for your initials. And that's when I realized, you know what? My parents are evil. Because when I signed off on my college paperwork, here's what I had to sign. Mm. That is a poor leadership decision right there, people. Now, anybody here got those parents? Anybody's mom just loves online shopping? You know, likes to buy stuff out of catalogs. So for me, before online shopping came on, there was catalogs. And like they had the Lily and Vernon catalog, Montgomery Ward, things like that. My mom would get the catalog and she would buy like, you know, the school clothes. And it, and it made it really bad when it came to like high school and college. Because she would buy the stuff and they had that little thing that says, would you like free embroidery? She checked yes. Would you like to put your initials on it? She checked yes. So imagine having all your clothes in high school and college with those initials on it. I went to complain to my dad about mom's issues and he goes it could have been worse I'm like how could it be worse he goes i'm in the army i was going to name you frank ulysses kitchen <laughs> she got it in the back the rest of the room's still trying to figure it out <laughs> i'm letting you know everybody it's okay to laugh because if you laugh then you're having fun if you're having fun you're more engaged if you're more engaged you're going to learn and for me i told people i had to learn about myself really quick because what i learned was in high school and college i realized no one's going to date me with that name <laughs> like i played basketball no one called me kitchen it was living room, dining room, bathroom. And most of the time it was, don't pass in the bathroom. I'm like, what woman is going to want to date me if their parents see my initials on the clothes and I walk through and meet her dad? Uh-uh, that's not happening. And let alone, who would want to marry me? Because then I have to have the name Mrs. Kitchen? That sounds like something that you buy in an infomercial. <laughs> Late night infomercial, 1995, a Mrs. Kitchen slices, dices, chops. No one wants to do that. But I got lucky. I did meet a young lady. This is her right there. His name is Kelly. Things were going really good. Aw, thank you. <laughs> I feel so special too. I felt awesome when she said yes. I'm like, yes. I was like, you know what my name is? She's like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yep, Kelly Kitchen, right. But it gets even worse. It'd be KK if she decides to marry me. 
Who was it? KK. <laughs> so things are going good. I like her, she likes me. I don't want to kill her, she doesn't want to kill me. Things are going so good that I decide I'm going to drop down on one knee and say, will you marry me? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I grew up in leadership, and leadership means you have to have you know, some great decisions. You have to think ahead. So I'm like, you know what? I really want her to say yes. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not only going to drop down on one knee. I'm going to have yes written in about 10 different languages spread out around me just to make sure she knows what to say. <laughs> I'm going to say really nice stuff about her and hold it up. So I did that. Plan was working really good until the fact of she left me here on this knee. And I'm like looking at her, like, you ever going to say yes? She's like, no. I'm like, you're not going to say yes? She's like, no, just keep saying nice stuff about me. <laughs> so I kept saying nice stuff about her, and she did say yes. So yes, we're getting married. Now let me explain something about my wife, everybody, really quick. She's half Irish, half Mexican, and a former school teacher. That means I never win a conversation in my house. <laughs> All the time, she is constantly testing me. And one night, she came out at 3 o'clock in the morning with a test and had positive results on it. She goes, we're pregnant. Uh, so all the women are like, oh, watch this. I'm going to change the reaction from the women in the room really quick. You're all going, oh. She told me we're pregnant. I looked at her and I go, uh-oh. <laughs> For the gentleman who just laughed right now, all the ladies are looking at you. That is the wrong answer to give to your wife. <laughs> Now, uh-oh, wasn't the fact that we had to, you know, have a kid, because I wanted to have two kids. I'm like, two kids are great. I told her I wanted to have kids. But I realize now I'm in a leadership position, and we have to name the children. I have been tortured all my life with my name. We have to name the kids. I don't want them to think dad's not a cool person, because I want my kids, you know, at some point I know my kids. I do have kids now. I'll tell you. I'll show you a picture of them in a second. They're going to say three things, four things that dad just don't want to hear. Dad, you're not cool. So I don't want to screw up their life with the name that I give them. So I was like, you know what? I've been tortured all my life. Let's make sure we pick out a good name. So she's like, here's what we do. Write down all the names that you like and let me see them. I was like, okay. So I wrote them down on a piece of paper. I gave them to her. She's a teacher. She pulls out a red ink pen. <laughs> she decides to start crossing off all the names. I failed the test. I got zero out of 100. I was like, what are wrong with these names? She goes, these are the names of all the kids who caused trouble in my classroom. You need to try again. So we started to think, I'm like, okay, well, we gotta have a boy's name and a girl's name. And I go, you know what, I know this guy named Kevin doesn't cause any trouble. She goes, I know a guy named Kyle. Women, you're smart creatures, correct? My wife is a smart person. She goes, here's what we're going to do. I've got a great idea. You like Kyle, I like Kevin, let's put them together. Kyle, Kevin, kitchen. Mm, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to think ahead in leadership. That is not going to be a good decision. So I was like, you know what? Hopefully we don't have a boy because that kid's going to have some issues. <laughs> so I was like, what about a girl's name? She goes, well, I like the name Olivia. I'm like, oh, I like Olivia too. And I'm like, uh-oh. She's like, why do you keep saying uh-oh? Every daughter wants their father to love them. And my daughter, if I have a girl, will come to me and say, Dad, what do you think about me? And I go, you're okay. <laughs> so things are just not working here. So we go down to the doctor and he said, do you know what the baby is? And I said, yes, we know what the baby is. He's like, well, you have no choice. Check out the picture. It's a boy. So yes, things are going good. And yes, we do have a little boy. And he actually celebrated his fourth birthday last week. That's my son, Elijah. Aw. Everybody saying, aw. 95% of the time, that's him. Other 5% of the time, especially when I travel and I call in just to check in and be a good dad. He's like, hi, dad. And then goes click and hangs up on me <laughs> because he's got his mom's phone and he's watching YouTube. <laughs> so life is going good. We've got our son. We didn't mess his name up. Everything's really good. And then all of a sudden, 4 o'clock in the morning, I don't know why my wife tests in the middle of the morning. <laughs> she comes out and goes, guess what? We're pregnant. This time I didn't say uh-oh because I didn't want to be on the couch. <laughs> but I'm thinking like, uh-oh. Hopefully it's going to be a girl because if it's a boy, we don't have another name picked out. And we did have a little girl and she turned one last year. It's my daughter, Olivia. Thank you. So now a lot of people are like, well, she is okay. Like, he wants to just go hug her, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> there are videos online if you want to go see her doing stuff. Okay, so I'll just, if you want to go on Instagram, I post pictures of her all the time. Now people are going, well, your daughter's okay. It's like, no, she's more than okay. We wanted her to be special. So based off of our family heritage and name, we named her Olivia Anora Kitchen. So peaceful honors kitchen. So she's okay. <laughs> Now, the reason I'm showing you my family, everybody, is one is just to let you know a little bit more about myself, but also let you know this is my motivation. Those three pairs of eyes are what motivate me to do what I want to do. 
And what I do is I travel around the world working with groups just like yourself. And my ultimate goal is to educate, elevate, and empower all of you to be great leaders. That's what I want to do for my family. I want to lead them in the right direction. But most importantly, I want to work with you to be great leaders because you're going to lead people into the right direction also. And when it comes down to leadership, quite simply, and if you want to write this one down, leadership is the ability to educate, elevate, or empower an individual or group to live a dream. I'll repeat it one more time. Leadership is the ability to educate, elevate, or empower an individual or a group to live a dream. And quite simply, that's what I do, everybody. I travel around the world, running my mouth, talking to people about dreams. Pretty awesome, huh? Do we have any people in the room right now are told that they talk way too much? You can be honest. Too loud. Okay, too loud. You know, here's what I'm going to let you know right now, Omar. I am visual proof that there is hope for you. <laughs> Because I was always told that I talk too much, ask too many questions, but now I get a chance to travel around the world talking to people. And guess what? I get paid for it too. So it's pretty awesome. But what I do is everybody, I talk to people about their dreams. Anybody here by a show of hands? How many people here have ever had a dream? Just raise your hands. Like, see, when I do this around midterms at colleges, the hands do not go up. Like, we do not have time to dream. <laughs> now, here's my next question. How many people here have had a dream that was just so awesome so special that it woke you up in the middle of the night? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thomas hears me, all right. How many people had that dream where it was so awesome, so special, it woke you up in the middle of the night that you worked hard to go back to sleep to get back into the dream <laughs> where you left it off, yeah. yeah. She's like, that's me, she's like, that just talks to me. She's like, it's just like Netflix. It's like you stop it and then you come back and it starts right in the same spot. But it doesn't work. But when you get back into the same spot and it's working for you, it's so good you're having a great dream, you've got to share it with somebody, right? So has anybody woken up the next morning? And it used to be you'd rush in and find your friend or, you know, anybody, your work spouse, if you guys are working, you know, you have the people you work around so much that they tell them everything. Now we just get our phone and we text or we, you know, Snapchat, whatever. But we have to go share that with people, right? I had an awesome dream. Anybody ever done that one? You had to share with people? And then look back at you and go, what was the dream about? I don't know. <laughs> but it was so good I had to get back into it. And the reason we want to share it with people, the reason we talk about it is because we want to live it. And I tell people, here's the case. Dreams you only talk about become a fantasy. The dreams you work to live become a reality. The reason we try to get back into these dreams, everybody, is because we want to live them. The reason we share it with people is because we want to live them. And if you think about any great leader, it all starts with a dream. People are like, well, no, a leader's got to have a plan. And we can think about it right now. It's February. It's Martin Luther, you know, it's Black History Month. We talk about Martin Luther King a lot. And he always said, I had a dream. He never was like, I have a plan. Leaders get people excited based off of the dream that they have. And if you ever look up the definition of plan, or actually not even plan, if you look up the definition of goal, it says a goal is a dream with a plan. So we have to have a dream first. Now here's a tough one really quick. You're all leaders, and as a leader you can lead yourself personally or professionally. How many people here have had a dream that they have not lived yet? That it just keeps them up at night, they're just, they, they want to live it. it. It just makes you mad when you see somebody else living that dream. You're like, I had that idea. So we've got that dream. Here's what we're going to do. You don't hear most speakers say this. I know most of you have them out already. Pull your phones out for me real quick, please. Like, huh? What's going on? All right, so pull your phones out. I'm going to ask you to turn your camera on right now. You're like, what? Turn your camera on. We're actually going to take a selfie. And here's how it's going to work out. If you got to get yourself camera ready, go ahead. And you know, for me, that's why I'm bald, because it's easy to get camera ready. <laughs> but I want you to get yourself camera ready. I want you to go ahead and take the best selfie possible of yourself right now. So go ahead and take a quick selfie of yourself. Okay. I'm going to jump in Donovan's picture. He's going to send that to me. Thank you. All right, so we've got that picture. <laughs> now here's what I want you to do. It gets even tougher now. You know that dream that you wanted to live, that you have not lived yet? Whatever form of social media you use, if you use Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I want you to jump on there right now. I want you to post that picture. So I want you to get that picture up. And I want you in the comment or the statement area, I would love for you to write down that one dream that you want to live. So you can write it down. The dream I want to live is, and then fill it in. And then at the end of it, I want you to hashtag it, my dream. And then here's the ultimate piece, because I got people looking at me now like, oh my God, this is so scary. <laughs> I want you to hit send, post, put onto the storyboard, whatever you want to do. I want you to go ahead and do that right now. Oh, people are like, uh-oh. How many people did that? Hands up. How many people are afraid to do it? Hands up. Here's my question for you. As a leader, 
if you're trying to lead yourself or a group, if you are afraid to share your dreams with people, what's the opportunity or the chance of you living it? People always talk about they have things in their head. Well, if it's in your head and not out of your head, how can you live it? In order to live your dreams, people, you have to be passionate about it. You have to be able to share it. Because many times when you share your dream with somebody, they're actually so excited about your dream, they will help you try to live it. So you don't have to do it right now, but I'm going to challenge you, before you leave the conference today, if you've got one big dream, I want you to post it out there and share it with people. And it's funny, you can actually go look up, there's a hashtag, my dream, or a hashtag I started up, it's called live my dream, L-I-V, my dream. And when you see what people are posting out there, you start to find out that people have the same dream as you. You connect with people that way. You find out that people are willing to go and share it. It actually empowers you to see that other people are actually willing to go step out of their comfort zone to say, here's what I want to go and do. And many times you want to go out and help them. Now, I've got a lot of people eyeballing me right now, going, okay, big bad speaker, talking about sharing our dreams, putting stuff out there. Have you ever done this? Yes, I do this on a daily basis. I have lots of big dreams, a lot of dreams that I've lived, a lot of dreams that I have not lived. And one of the biggest dreams I have ever had, I shared with people, and many of the people told me I was crazy. Anybody here had a dream that was so big they just told you you were crazy? Mm -hmm. Well, here's my dream, everybody. It's called the marathon. That is a big dream. Anybody here know what the marathon's about? <laughs> Some people are like, it's running, yeah. <laughs> well, let me give you a quick history lesson about the marathon. The marathon is you know, named after or in honor of a messenger. Because back in Greek times, how it worked out was there would be messengers, and the messengers would report who would win battles or share the information. There's no Twitter, there's no Snapchat, there's no social media, no news at five. There's the messengers doing it. And the messengers, I don't know why they did or didn't do this, they ran. There is no horse. I'm like, I would have jumped on a horse to go deliver the message. But they ran. So there was a battle. Uh oh, there we go. All right. See, that goes with the. See, I'd have, I'd have some music going too. All right. So the messenger goes almost 26.2 miles to deliver who won the Battle of Marathon. And he dies on the spot. That is my dream. No, not to die on the spot. <laughs> My dream is to run 26.2 miles. I want to run this race. I'm like, that's a big challenge. And if I set my goals high and if I can do a marathon, I can do anything. So I have to go share this with somebody. It's a big dream. So I go share it with my wife. So I share it with her. I was like, I would like to run a marathon. She looks at me and goes, I would like to run one too. Gentlemen, if you've got a girlfriend, a wife, significant other, a friend who is a woman, and you say to them, I would like to do something, and they go, I would like to do it too? That means you are doing it. <laughs> there are no ifs, ands, or buts. Within 30 minutes, we were signing up for the marathon. Now, the funny part about the marathon, everybody, is when you go sign up for it, on there goes non-refundable deposit. Now, you all know, because you're college students, you get your apartment, so it's a deposit usually means you get it back, right? I'm like, if it's a non-refundable deposit, that means it's a payment. I am not getting it back. So when we sign up for this race, if I run or don't run, I've lost my money. So I better start training. Now, when I signed up, I was like, this thought is pretty cool. And I'm getting ready to train. I'm talking to friends and people on how to train for this. And I find out it's going to take four to six months to train for a 26.2 mile race to nowhere in honor of a guy who died. <laughs> this is my dream. They're all telling me I'm crazy because I work from home. My office is about 20 feet away from my bedroom. So I don't drive 26.2 miles in a day, and I'm going to run this. So I talked to my wife, like, we got to work on this, we got to plan. She goes, well, how about we train together? Now, if you remember the picture of my wife earlier, let me explain something about her. She's five foot two. I'm six foot two. So there's about a foot difference there. I live in Glendale, Arizona, everybody. And my wife's plan was in Glendale, Arizona, where it's hot, was we would train together. And her plan was, she goes, you're a foot taller, you run faster, so I'd like to train with you, but it's not going to work. I'm like, no kidding. So she goes, here's what we're going to do. She's like, I'm going to go run out first. And then you wait at home. And then maybe about 30 minutes later, you leave and you catch up with me. So I want you to run after me and catch me. Now, I don't know where everybody grew up or anything like that, but let me explain this. Glendale, Arizona, there's not a lot of people who look like me. Okay? You saw my wife. Her plan is to run down city streets. A man who's a foot taller than her. And to chase her down on the streets. That was not a brilliant plan especially when the police decide to have a conversation with me. When I explained to them that we're training for the marathon, they looked at me and go, you're crazy. And I got back to training. 
Now, are there any people in this room who like to run? Have been part of a track team, stuff like, okay, I got issues with you people. <laughs> because when I was training for the marathon, I was feeling good about myself, but I was running, okay? That's running. Where are those people who like running again? Hands up. These people with their hands up, we're going to call them runners. <laughs> There's a difference between people who run and runners. And when I woke up on marathon race day, and I go downtown Phoenix at 6 o'clock in the morning to a race to nowhere, where everybody tells me I'm crazy, I see runners. I was feeling good during my training, felt really good about myself, but I see runners. Everything with a runner matches head to toe. <laughs> Let's just call it a University of Toledo runner. So everything was blue and gold, blue and yellow. Everything was matching, okay? Under Armour, Adidas, Nike, it didn't matter. Everything matched. I got a gym t-shirt and shorts on. Not feeling good. These runners, they're doing stretches I have never seen before. <laughs> they can get their leg behind their head. I can't touch my toes. I'm not feeling good. What I ended up doing was I decided I'm going to look cool and be like a runner. So I would stand next to the runners and I would just make up stretches. <laughs> just so I could feel good about myself. Because runners, they're a unique group. And the runners in the room, be completely honest. They are honest people. If there is a slow person in front of you, will you run them down? See, they said, yeah, they didn't even take time to think about it. Like, yes. <laughs> I'm supposed to run with these people. But while we're stretching and looking good, I hear the announcer come on and goes, runners to your positions. Didn't say people who run and runners. They go, so I'm like, okay, I'm feeling good. So I go to my position. But the runners, they're fast people. They put them all up front. The people who run, they put you in the back. So I go to the back and they go, race, begin. It took me 30 minutes just to get to the starting line, people. That's how far back I was. Now, during this whole process, my dream was to run the race. But while I'm watching all this going on, now I've put a plan to it. And my goal has become to finish the race. Because I don't want to just run it. I want to finish it. So what is my ultimate goal, everybody? To do what? Finish the race. This is where you can actually interact with me right now. So my goal is to do what? Finish the race. So we start to run. Now we've got the runners and they look cool. Have you ever seen like the Olympics and you got runners in it? Like with me, I'm like, this doesn't look so cool. Runners are like, so I decided I'm going to look cool like the runners. When they said, runners, begin, I started running. That's the front view. Side view. I was looking good. So mile one going down the streets, looking good. Mile two, still looking good. Mile three, looking good. Now, I'm going to teach you something really quick. With the runners in the room, they're going to tell you how crazy I am. Because if you haven't noticed, I'm a guy. I used to be a former athlete. We've got an ego, and we've got this whole competitive streak inside of us. We can't stick to the plan. And the original plan was just to run the race and try to finish it. Maybe finish it maybe five hours if you're lucky. But for me, as soon as I got into that race, things changed. I saw the sign in front of me. It said 4.15. In the first three miles, I chopped 45 minutes off my scheduled time. Runners, is that good? Mm -mm. Right. But my goal is to do what? Finish the race. So I keep going. So I'm running down the street. <laughs> looking cool, feeling cool. Mile five, <laughs> still looking cool. Mile six, <laughs> I am not feeling so cool right now. There's this woman who is 70 years old who passes me up with a sign on the back going 50 marathons in 50 states. But I keep running. At mile nine, that's a slow motion, feeling really good. I look to the side, there's a woman on the side of the road. Paramedics are there. They are working on her. She lived. He's like concerned, so right there. Yeah, she lived, it's okay, it's okay. She lived, but now I'm realizing, wait, my dream here could actually kill me. Because they're working on the person. So now I'm starting to think about this and I keep going. And at mile 13.1, because this race is 26.2, it's not 26, 26.2, it's at 13.1, the halfway point. I've got family and friends who are there. And they go, Frank, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Was that the right answer? No. Because for the first 13 miles, everybody, things are looking good. We ever been to that party where just everything is working out good, everything's just going, but then all of a sudden something happens at the party to start to ruin it? Well, at mile 14, the left side was still having a party, looking good. The right side said, you know what, I don't like this party anymore. 
And it decided to start going like this. I don't know if the body's supposed to do that <laughs> while you're running, but that's what happened. Let's put these pieces together. That's how mile 14 started, okay? So I'm going down the road. But my goal is to do what? So I keep going. But then all of a sudden at mile 15, the left side goes, that looks pretty cool. Let me try something. And the leg's supposed to bend, right? Not anymore. So now this one is like a one-legged pirate. And this one's going like this. So it's like, eh, eh. that's me going down the road now. Now, if you've ever seen a marathon or been to one, there are people on the side cheering you on. They're giving you stuff, brownies, bananas, oranges. There's kids like just cheering you on. Here's me, eh, 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 going down the road. The kids turned around, looked at their parents and go, he scares me. <laughs> Why I'm trying to make my way down the road? Eh. Because I hear, eh, eh. I'm like, what's eh, eh? I was like, I'm in the road. There's not supposed to be any cars. Eh, eh. I'm like looking around. And all of a sudden, this thing pulls up to the side of me. It's a bus. At the marathon, I didn't know about it. There's this thing called the I Quit Bus. <laughs> this bus drives around looking for people <laughs> who look like they are in trouble and asks and offers to take them to the finish line. So here's me. Eh. You want to get on the bus? No. Why are you calling me? You, you in trouble? I'm not in trouble. <laughs> and it pulls off. Now at this point, as the bus is pulling off, I realize as I look around me, power walkers have caught up with me. I have slowed down that much. You know, power walkers. They're not only catching up with me, they're passing me. So using my supercomputer brain, I reanalyzed things and said, you know what? You look kind of freaky. What should you do? I was like, I should become a power walker but I'm gonna be a cool power walker. Front view, side view. That's me going down the street now about mile 16, trying to power walk. Then I have one of my good friends calls me up. One of the people told me I'm crazy for doing this race. And he calls up and he goes, hey Frank. I know people are like, wait, calls up, let me, let me rewind. I'm going down the street. I hear bring, bring. That's my ringtone. I grab my phone, some people are like, why do you have your phone? In case I need help. <laughs> and it takes selfies. And it's my friend Roger, and Roger goes, how did the race go? And I go, I'm still running. <laughs> and he goes, you're crazy, he's like, I wouldn't do it. He's like, more power to you, and he hangs up on me. I didn't even get a chance to ask for help. <laughs> and while this is going on with the power walking, I start to look around me, and I've made my way up to about mile 20, and mile 20 is called hitting the wall. And at this point, this is a running race, everybody, and there's about 20,000 people who are supposed to run in this race to nowhere. But when I look around, all the cool people I saw at the starting line all look worse than me now. Any Walking Dead fans? <laughs> it picks up again on Sunday. Hopefully this part of the season is going to be better than the first half, right? She's like, uh-huh. She's like, I hope so. I told people I was in the airport one day, and CNN was on in the airport, and they're showing that there's going to be a Walking Dead ride in California. And they're having people having auditions to be zombies. And they're teaching people how to walk like zombies. And they had the you know, reporter go on and like, OK, zombie. <laughs> OK, you're fired. Like, what? It's like, you don't look like you're dead enough. I was like, how do we know what the undead walk like? Do we have like, scientific proof of what a dead person walks like? <laughs> and they're like, it doesn't work. It's like, I told people, it's like, if you want to get some people for that show, or get some people for that event, go to the marathon after mile 20. Because there are people there, and it's like, <laughs> There are people I saw just like this, like, finish the race. Finish the There's some people I know they were talking, but it just didn't come out audibly. <laughs> the only thing I heard was this one guy, and I don't know what the relationship he and his wife has. Like, I hate her. <laughs> she signed me up. <laughs> so when I look around, I realize I'm not so bad anymore, because everybody, no one is running. They're just dragging themselves through. So I keep going, and at mile 26, everybody, I see my good friend, his name is Brian, and Brian is there and he goes, hey Frank, how are you feeling? And I gave him a finger. <laughs> it wasn't the thumb. <laughs> and he looked back at me and he goes, I know how you're feeling, but you're almost there. You can finish the race. And where are my runners here, especially the competitive runners? At mile 26.1, I became that guy, that person that you've got issues with. Anybody ever seen the people where they just kind of like dog it the whole time, but then as soon as they see the finish line and people there, things start to happen? 
So for me, I was trying to run. I was like talking to my body, like run. I was looking like Forrest Gump. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I became like, oh, I was running. Because I could see the finish line. There's some people who laughed at me on the course and called me old, stiff arm. They're not going across with me. <laughs> and when I got to the finish line, I took the best picture ever. I finished my race. Five hours, 12 minutes, and 48 seconds of terror. But I had finished it. And once I finished it, I went to the first aid, paramedics. <laughs> I got ice for my knees. And then I went over to the podium, and I had a press conference. Live across the world, I, Frank Kitchen, officially retire from running marathons. <laughs> because my goal was to finish one race. Now some people were going, well, where's your wife? She started ahead of me. At some point, I passed her up. I lost her. I found out from friends at the finish line that she wasn't there yet. So I went to the finish line to wait for her. And while I'm waiting for her, everybody, I watch more people come across the finish line. And everybody had the same smile that I did. I also found out at the finish line, because a bus came up and dropped some people off, I found out about 15 to 20 percent of the people who sign up for marathons never finish. Something mentally or physically happens to them where they just can't make it through. I also found out a lot of people finish faster than me, a lot of people finish slower than me. But everybody had the same smile if they finished. Kids, about 15 or 16, people as close to 80, all running this race to finish it up. And they all had the same smile, and about an hour later, my wife came across. The reason I'm sharing this with you right now, it was funny to hear the story, but the reason I'm sharing it with you is, your life, whether it be you're gonna go into leadership for yourself, leadership for an organization, you are all leaders. You all have a big dream, dreams that people tell you you're crazy to have. There's gonna be points during the dream where you look really good, but you try to compare yourself to other people and trying to look cool. There's gonna be points where you really don't look good, you look like a zombie, that's midterm and finals week. You're trying to drag yourself, why does I want this class? I hate my academic advisor. <laughs> you don't look good, but you have to make it through because the point, everybody, is we can't quit. I'll talk about it in a little bit, but the thing is, our body will quit before our mind ever does. And if you can stay mentally strong to pull yourself through something, great things will happen. And the case is you have to finish it. We've got some people who will finish school in three and a half years, some people are gonna finish it in seven, some people are professional students, they're just gonna be here forever. But I bet you when they walk across the stage, they have the same smile. And if you remember, when you graduate, or you accomplish your goal or dream, no one really ever asks, how long did it take or what's the time? They just give you the high five and point and say you're special because you did it. Anytime I say I've run a marathon, of which I've run two now, no one ever asked me what your time was. They just go, congratulations for running it. So for us, we have to stop comparing ourselves to other people and letting people judge us. You have your own dream. It's your dream. Success is living your dream. So you define what your success is. Don't worry about comparing yourself to other people. You can learn from other people. I had friends who ran a marathon. I talked to them and they gave me tips. But my one friend runs in Boston. He runs under three hours. I will never run like him. But he gave me tips, so I don't try to compare myself. The thing is, I just want to be like him and finish the race. Now, I run this race and everything was good, everybody. I'm feeling really good about life. I've accomplished big things. I'm retired. I'm going to go off and save the world. But then all of a sudden, something happens to me. I used to work in education. I used to help coach basketball. One of my former athletes contacts me. He goes, hey, coach, I'm going to be giving a speech. I know you're a speaker. Will you come watch me give that speech and critique me? So she had flown into Phoenix, Arizona to give this speech. So I go to watch her give this speech. The speech was so powerful because she's talking to people about a nonprofit that's raising money for kids in Africa. And the way they raise money is to run marathons by raising money and getting people to sponsor. It was so powerful, I signed up for another marathon. Six years after the first. Now most of you looking at me right now and go, you are crazy. Yeah, I was crazy. Oh, let me show you something really quick just to do this one. Here's proof that I finished the race. Right there, I, just, I, got, I got to show that and I took a crazy picture. So I finished that race and I start training. And why I'm training, things are going good because I don't want to be hurt like the time before. And why I'm raising money for this group. I get a phone call. My mom's in the hospital. Two strokes. Medical bills. How are you going to take care of it? She's in South Carolina, I'm across the country. How do I help her out? Because I'm like, the money to fly out there probably would help with the medical bills. I'm like, I'm training for this marathon. I call the organization up and said, hey, I've got a family emergency. I would like to use that money you know, that I'm going to raise. That go for it. Put it all over social media. Tell people, like, here's the deal. I'm helping my mom out. I'm going to run the race. This time I go back, I run the race again. Same exact race. This time I finish six minutes faster. 
This time I finish without getting hurt. And most importantly, my mom is there at the finish line. Bills are all paid. And she's there to watch me come across for her. Earlier I told everybody, do you have a dream? We all have a dream. And we have that dream. We're motivated to go do it and we're doing it for ourselves because this world is all about me, me, me. Do it for yourself. But if you really want to be motivated, try to figure out how your dream can impact and help somebody else. Because for me, this time when I ran the race, I ran better and stronger and I couldn't quit because I knew I was doing it for my mom and for all the people who were watching me around the world who had given me money to help her out. I couldn't let those people down. The dream was still to finish the race, but this time the dream was not only to finish the race, but to help somebody else. So I was using my dream, my passion, my talents to help somebody else and help myself. And that drives you even more because this time, first time I felt, finished the race, I was kind of empty. It's like, okay, I did it. Eh. This time when I finished the race, I told people I felt fresh. If you think about the word fresh right now, just help me out. Is the word fresh positive or negative? Positive. positive. Right. Just right now, just close your eyes. Think of something that's fresh. Fresh out of the bakery, fresh food, fresh phone, fresh car, fresh A on your paper. Yeah, it, all, it makes you smile, right? Just thinking of that word makes you smile. I tell people if you say the word, it will make you smile even bigger. So on the count of three, just say the word fresh. One, two, three. Fresh. See, I got people smiling right now. They're like, like they're giggling. You know what? And there's one person, I don't know if you heard over here, my ears stick out, they pick up everything. Okay. They're small, but they're powerful. But I heard one person over here go, shh. So here's what we're going to do. College students, we're competitive people. We like to have some fun. I think I should give you something for this. On a count of three, just to have a little bit of fun here, we're going to say the word fresh, but we're going to stretch it out. We're going to go, shh. <laughs> now I have to give a quick warning. I am CPR certified, Donovan CPR certified, but there's about 270 of you in this room. We cannot save all of you. If you start to say the word shh, fresh, okay, and you start to turn blue, purple, blue or yellow, like the school colors, let it out. Because we can't rescue all of you. It's not that important. For those of you who want to kind of cheat and go shh, 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 that doesn't count either. So on the count of three, we're going to say fresh. We've got it on camera. If you want to, pull your phones out. It's kind of fun to watch this one. Wait, anybody here on the swim team? Anybody ever been on the swim team? Watch out for these people. On the count of three, here we go. We're going to say fresh, but we're going to stretch it all the way out. One, two, three. Fresh. I lost it. Wait, I hear one. Who's the person doing? I'm here. One more. <laughs> okay, let it go. You guys both win. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the two guys right here. Like, you were almost red. <laughs> but here's the funny part, everybody. Let me watch this. We did something right there that was new, exciting, great, wanted, and needed just to create a positive environment experience just by saying the word fresh. And that's what fresh means, to do something that is new, something that is exciting, something that is great, something that is wanted, something that is needed to produce a positive environment experience. This is what leaders do. Don't we want to be around a fresh environment, something where new things are going on? Be around fresh people, people who do exciting things. Somebody, you know, be a part of a fresh culture or organization where they're doing great and needed things. And I tell people, wanted and needed does not mean that you're going to like it but you will like the results of it. We all want to be around something that is fresh. For me running that race, it beat me up. But the experience, and for people writing the notes down, pull your phones out, take a picture. It makes it a lot easier. I know sometimes professors say don't do that. Do it. <laughs> when I went to college, the whole case was we had recorders out and we would kind of record the stuff. If you got the phone, turn the phone on, record this, do video, record the audio, or even take a picture. That just proves to me that it's important to you. If it's important to you, do it. So the case is, everybody, we're talking about fresh. That's kind of like when someone's still going, shh. All day, you're just going to hear people going, shh. I went back to school yesterday just to drop in. I spoke at them in, in October. I went by just to say hi. I'm walking down the hall, every kid who saw me is just going, fresh. <laughs> <laughs> My mom has actually come out to see me speak sometimes, and she was starting to laugh because we were in a conference in South Carolina and getting in the elevator, and people are like, Frank. I'm like, what? Like, fresh. <laughs> it's going to stick in your mind, but if you have any of those negative moments, just think about that word. It will pick you up. But I told people, I'm here more than just to make you laugh and smile today. I want you to go out and be great leaders, and I want you to live this. Because one thing to think about it, 
But once we step out these doors, we're back into the real world. So what do we do to live it? So there's five steps to living it. And the first thing you have to think of, everybody, is you are all difference makers and life changers. You are all leaders. It doesn't matter about a title or position that you have because all of you are life changers and difference makers. You're all going to come in contact with somebody in your life. Today you're going to probably meet a couple hundred different people. And it's a choice of what type of difference maker and life changer you are. The choice is, are you going to be a positive difference maker on somebody or a negative? Our actions, our words, what we post online affect what type of difference maker and life changer we are. And even now, especially with your generation, I was talking earlier here, we're having a night, oops, where are you hiding there? It's like, <laughs> Anna, Anna and I are talking. Everything you do nowadays is there forever. People are going to find it, whether you post it, say it, you, you go out, you think you're your friend, somebody takes a picture, it's there. For me and Donovan and people like that, we didn't have all this fancy stuff when we were growing up, so everything's just hearsay. There's no proof of it. There's actually visual proof of everything that you do now, and you help show it. Like I see you know, Thomas right here, he's shaking his head. Right. We got stories from way back when, but no one, no one saw it but you and me. So unless you and me don't tell people about our pool picture out, no one really knows about it. But everything going on today, people are taking pictures, doing texts and everything like that. People can save that, pop it up there. So the thing is, if you're a difference maker and a life changer, you have to start thinking this way and going like, you know what? Is this going to have a positive or negative impact on other people, or is it going to have a positive or negative impact on myself? Because that time you're at a party and you happen to give that one finger up, Somebody saves that and they post it 10 years from now and you're going for an important leadership position. Someone's like, that's what they did? And you're like, that's 10 years ago, I was younger, but they'll still hold it against you. So we have to start thinking, when we come in contact with people, I'm smiling at people, I'm high-fiving, I'm saying thank you to everybody because I want to have a positive impact on your life. And I want everybody here to be certified fresh. And to be certified fresh, you've got to do five things. You can write this one down or you can take a picture of the screen. But here's what I want you to do. And think about the marathon story. The first thing is, I want you to be focused, everybody. And the focus is, what's your big dream or your big passion? We all have dreams, we all have passions, or we all have a purpose. But what is that focus that you have in your life? Because everything should reflect around that focus. Thank you for sharing that with me, Donovan, last night. Everything should reflect around your focus. So if it has a positive impact on your focus, don't do, or do it. <laughs> if it has a negative impact on your focus, don't do it. So obviously you want to graduate here from college, so every decision you make should have a positive impact on that focus. If you're trying to go own your own company after college, then everything you do right now should have a positive impact on that. So you've got to be focused. For me in the race, it's all about the training. The focus was to finish the race, so I focused on my training. The next piece was I had to become resourceful. Resourceful means you have to think about everything that you can do versus everything that you can't. We're in a world right now where everything is negative, and all the things people tell you to do is what you can't do. But guess what? Nobody can do everything. You have to think about what can you do and what are you good at. You are some of the most creative people in the world. I worked for nine years at a college in student activities. I had several students who came to me and said, hey, can you help me out because I can't take my final. Why can't you take your final? Well, they did it a week earlier and I can't get into it. It's like, why couldn't you get into it? It's like, um, I kind of made up an excuse. What was the excuse you made for getting out of your final? Well, I lost five sets of grandparents. I lost six parents. I lost eight dogs. I lost three hearts. I'm like, wait a second. You got that creative to get out of a test and now you're trying to get back into it? Why don't you just study for it? I actually worked in a point where we had a student who went to the study lab. They actually were a graphics arts major. They actually made the candy bar wrapper, and in the candy bar wrapper where the ingredients were, they put all the answers to the test. They got busted. We asked, how long did it take you to put this together? It was like, oh, about six to seven hours. Couldn't you have studied for the test <laughs> <laughs> to pass it? So some people are resourceful, but be resourceful the wrong way. If you look around this room right now, Everybody in this room is a human resource to you. When I went to college, I had a guy who, who sat next to me. We became friends later on. He actually did my wedding ceremony. Because we met at a conference like this at a college. If you see people as a resource and somebody who can help you out, you see them as a difference maker and a life changer, great things happen. So be resourceful. Then after that, you've got to be enthusiastic. Because in the race, my resourcefulness was I started to walk. Because they just said finish the race. They didn't say how you had to finish it. But then I got enthusiastic. Because enthusiastic, it wasn't about the 26.2 miles that I had to run. It was enthusiastic about the fact of I get to finish the race. And at the end of the race, they give you a medal. They give you a jacket. And there's a massage therapy school at the finish line that gives you a one-hour full-body massage. I was excited about that. We're enthusiastic about the results of our work. How many people are enthusiastic about writing a term paper? <laughs> right. How many people are enthusiastic about getting the an A and getting that paper out the way? See? 
We are enthusiastic. So let that be the driving force, everybody. You're enthusiastic about the results of the work. How many people are ready for spring break and some of you are going out of town to somewhere warm? Doesn't that drive and motivate you to go do something good? Yes. So we're enthusiastic about the results of the work we put in. Then after that, everybody, we got to stay strong. And we got to stay strong mentally. I talked about it earlier. The body will quit before your mind ever does. So if your mind quits really quick, then guess what? The body's going to quit even faster. There are going to be tough times in life. There are no easy things out there. I tell people all the time. I go, you know what? Anything is possible, but nothing is easy. And we all want that easy button. We want everything easy to be handed to us. We are the now generation. My son right now, if the phone is buffering on YouTube, he wants to throw it. I've seen my phone thrown across the room several times. What is going on? The phone is not working for him. The internet's not working. Or even worse now, there is a commercial on. Because you guys don't even have commercials to worry about. It's just like, speed through. Netflix, Hulu, no commercials. You love that type of stuff. But tough times are going to happen, so you have to stay strong mentally. And you have to know that you're going to have those tough times. All my friends told me at mile 20, you're going to hit the wall. You're not going to feel good, but you have to drive your way through. For most of you, junior year, that is a tough year, isn't it? You're so close to the finish line. You can see it. You see your friends who are starting to walk across stage. And you're like, why do I have to keep doing this? But you have to stay strong mentally to push yourself through. When you have meetings with your organizations and you've got those people who are just causing trouble for you. We know those people. You have to think about the result that you have to get through because like, you know what? I'm going to deal with this tough situation right now to make sure that we have a great event next week. And then the final one, everybody, the H, you have to be honest. And I'm not telling you to be honest with other people. Number one is you have to be honest with yourself. For me, I had to check my ego at the door. I'm not a fast runner. So honestly, I had to realize all I can do is finish the race. Don't worry about time. Honestly, I had to go ask people for help because I didn't know much about running. Honestly, I couldn't blame anybody else. We're in a world where we want to blame and complain. It's almost become the American way now to blame and complain and point at other people. But honestly, do we look at ourselves? We want to blame the professor for that test. Did you study for it? We want to blame our counselors for making us take that class. Honestly, don't we need that class to, you know, graduate? Maybe we shouldn't take a night class, we should take a morning class. We have to be honest with ourselves. And the number one piece about being honest with yourself is being able to ask questions. Go out and seek knowledge. Because how many people ever had that situation, you want to ask a question in class, but you're embarrassed, so you don't answer, ask the question. Then you put your hand down, and then all of a sudden, the test shows up. And the first question on the test is that question you didn't ask. You have to be honest with yourself, everybody, and realize if you want to go somewhere, you want to make that dream happen, you have to figure out what do you have to do to make it happen and realize it all starts with you. You can't blame other people. If you need help, go ask for help. If you don't have the resources, go find them. If you don't have the focus, get focused. It comes down to you. And when you do that, I tell people you get to live fresh. And that's why I'm here today. I want all of you to live fresh. If you look at this hashtag, take a picture, I would love for you to use this. This has pretty much become my mission over the last six months. It says hashtag, I live fresh. We're in a world right now where we're seeing just more and more negativity every day, correct? Social media, television, people. We've just got nothing but negativity being spewed out all the time. And that's what we're being exposed to. And they say the more you're exposed to something, the more you believe that can happen. And I talked to a friend a few weeks ago, and he goes, you know what, there's a lot of negativity going on, but he goes, there's a lot more positive going on in this world than negative. He's like, we just don't see it. So if you're truly a leader, everybody, here's the challenge I'm going to have for you today when you step out. You can even start it right now. I've been asking people is, when you see experience or a part of something positive going on, let's go ahead and post it, take the picture, put it up there, and be a leader, and start the change. And hashtag it, I live fresh, or make your own hashtag that's a positive you know, reinforcement empowering peace. But put it out there, because look around the room right now. If we were to step out of this building, walk into society, and say college student, would they have a positive idea about you or a negative? Just mostly, what do you think? Negative, right? You party too much, you're lazy, you don't study, you know, you don't take, you know, you just want everything now, 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 me, me, me. But when you walk around this college, how many positive things do you see? People graduating, starting up businesses, entrepreneurs, passing a test, helping somebody out with the studying, finding a roommate, helping somebody out who's feeling a little homesick because they're from across the country. Does that happen every day? But do we see it? No. So we have to change the narrative, and that's what leaders do. We have to start showing people what is going on. So when you use your social media, start to show the positive things that are going on out there in your life, or that what you see. 
because and great things can happen because the story I want to kind of wrap this up with was I was at a school yesterday, I told you I went to go see the school. But several years ago with the school, it's in an area that's low income. It's about a third white, third Hispanic, third black. Title I schools. Always all this negativity about the you know, area. And one teacher, my best friend, puts on a video game tournament for the kids and says, okay, here's how you do the video game tournament. We're going to do this tournament. I'll get the media in. You guys bring in canned food. And the canned food will go to the homeless food shelter. They break the record for the homeless food shelter. News is coming out to record it and do everything like that. And then all of a sudden, before the cameras go on and they're doing the interview, they go, oh, we got to go. And everybody packs up and leaves. I'm like, what's going on? There's a gunshot down the street and a fire. We have to go cover that. But what about this? This is important. And the guy goes off the record. It's easier for us to cover the negative than it is the positive. So our chance to have something positive go on, we lost it and they went to cover the negative. And that was before social media. But now we can post all that stuff up to change the script, flip the script, and let people know what's going on. This is what I ask you to do as a leader. And it's all about changing your mindset and your attitude. And if you remember earlier when I first started this all out, I said I thought my parents were evil. And the important word was thought, because it wasn't true. My parents think that I can be a difference maker and life changer. And they did that starting with my name. My first name is Frank. I'm named after my father. Served 30 years in the US military, protecting our country, protecting our freedoms. Just retired, so I'm named after him. And even though we didn't have a relationship for about 20 years, we are building it back now. And he's constantly talking on Skype to his grandkids. Cornelius, that is the name of my grandfather. He passed away last year, served in World War II. Didn't learn how to read until he was 50, but still raised eight kids. South Carolina, had the gift of gab and could connect with anybody. So he taught me how to connect and talk with people. That's why I talk so much. So I'm named after him. And then the last name, Kitchen, that's everybody's favorite room in the house. <laughs> so it's always memorable. But by remembering that, my parents will let me know who I am, where I am, and where I can be. They also let me know with my initials, of which you'll see right here, because I do wear, wear them around now, is with my business. I do fundraising for nonprofits. I do consulting for businesses. And I do keynotes at colleges. So this is who I am. And when I told you earlier about your name, saying that you are special and you are awesome, if you are a difference maker and a life changer, people are going to remember you for your name and your actions. And any great leader who is truly living fresh, they don't only talk about it, that's a fantasy, they go and live it to turn into reality. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Frank Kitchen. This is how you keep in touch with me. Today is the beginning of a relationship. I want to keep this going. Keep in contact with me. I've got two workshops today. The energy, the attention you've given me so far here in this keynote, please give it to the other speakers today. Help them live fresh. But once again, don't just talk about it. Live it. Thank you so much, and have a great morning.